Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Waldo Social Studies YouTube channel. Uh, today, we are going to focus on lesson two of how did the United States careen towards civil war? Uh, this is the second of two installments, so uh, it is the same essential question from the first lesson. Uh, but if you're starting a new page of notes, uh, you could always put the essential question at the top again and put page two of your notes. So our first left side question today, and we are focusing on specific events that led to the Civil War. We've already learned about the compromises that were made to try and avoid the Civil War. We learned a little bit about the nullification crisis in South Carolina. Our first left side question today is, what was bleeding Kansas? Uh, and this is a term that is used to reference uh, a situation that recur occurred in Kansas and a little bit in Nebraska as well. In 1854, after the uh, Mexican-American War, the Missouri Compromise was repealed. So it had lasted 34 years, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed. So this replaced the Missouri Compromise. It was the idea of Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, who competed with Abraham Lincoln for senator in the state of Illinois and won and competed against Abraham Lincoln for president of the United States a few years later and lost. Uh, this law allowed Kansas and Nebraska to vote for whether or not they wanted slavery. And again, this is that idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, under the Compromise of 1850, this was allowed in New Mexico Territory and Utah Territory. And under this law, it was being extended to Kansas and Nebraska Territory. So rather than deciding these lands will be slave, these lands will be free, they were leaving it up to the people who moved into those territories who would then vote on whether or not they did or did not want slavery. Uh, it sounds great on paper, but it also has that effect of continuing to kick the can down the road. So the North saw this as a giveaway to the South. Since a lot of these lands were north of the Mason-Dixon line, the North was of the view that those lands should absolutely positively not be open to slavery because those lands were north of the Mason-Dixon line. So pro and anti-slave groups both moved to the area literally to fight over the land, and some of those fights became quite violent. So uh, as a result of some of those violent conflicts, um, people became convinced that this was not going to be resolved peacefully. It was not going to be resolved at the battle box, that it might come to blows. Uh, and that a civil war might be inevitable. Uh, Bleeding Kansas was the first canary in the coal mine that uh, started to make that very apparent. So our next left side question is, what was the Dred Scott decision of 1857? Uh, this was another event that happened that was a trigger, um, especially for the North, um, and this will be clear why uh, in just a moment. Dred Scott was a slave who was born in Virginia, which was a slave state, so he was born a slave. Over time, his owner moved him to many free states, including Illinois and Wisconsin. So the question becomes, if you're born a slave in a slave state, are you still a slave when you move to a free state? An interesting question. So when his owner finally died, Scott su sued for his freedom because he claimed that he had lived in free states and should therefore be free. And when his owner died, he was actually living in a free state. So many abolitionist lawyers came to his aid because they thought this was an important case 
uh, and would establish an important legal precedent that if you were a slave and you were moved into a free state that you could be freed. Uh, that was something that they very much wanted to fight for. So the Supreme Court eventually had to rule on this case, and at the time, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was a gentleman from Maryland by the name of Tanny. In 1857, the Supreme Court ruled, and this is not one of their best decisions, let's just put that out there, that slaves were not citizens and therefore were not protected by the Constitution. In other words, they ruled that slaves were property, not citizens, and they essentially had the same legal rights as your pet cat. And therefore, they could not legally sue in court. So they wouldn't even hear the case because the plaintiff, Dred Scott, was not even considered a person. Um, that was not something that was well received in the North. Uh, however, in the South, it told them that uh, the Supreme Court would basically uh, defend their right to keep their slaves and was not going to erode the institution of slavery. So consider this another chink in the armor um, that was keeping America from having a civil war. So our next important event was something called Brown's Raid. Uh, this was uh, something that very much upset the South. So the Dred Scott decision very much upset the North. Brown's Raid very much upset the South. And let's talk about that. Uh, John Brown was a radical abolitionist. His life was devoted to getting rid of slavery any way he could. Um, and uh, those pictures there convey that he was a rather intense guy. He wanted to start a slave rebellion in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. He was of the belief that if you gave slaves guns, they would fight for their freedom. So in October of 1859, he and a group of fellow abolitionists raided a weapons depot uh, in order to arm the slaves. So they broke into a federal weapons depot with the intention of taking those guns, giving them to the slaves, and that the slaves would automatically want to rise up and fight back against their masters. Uh, the raid lasted three days, uh, and what Brown didn't consider is that the slaves had been raised from birth to be obedient, um, and in some case, cases, um, were well treated by their masters, and so their their instinct was not, I need to escape any way I possibly can. Their instinct was, this is all I have ever known. Um, I, I can't fight back against it because I'm essentially fighting back against everything I've ever known. Um, and so when he did not get the support he was expecting, and then a gentleman by the name of Robert E. Lee, who at this point was a federal general, came in to quash this rebellion. Um, and he was rather insistent that it be quashed vigorously and ferociously. So Brown was captured. There was a trial. Uh, Brown definitely made his issue of abolitionism a massive feature of the trial, but uh, it was intended that he be made an example of. And so he was executed. Uh, it was kind of like the O.J. Simpson trial of its day. Of course, you guys are too young to know about the O.J. Simpson trial. Let's just say it was a circus. And if there were 24-7 television like there is today, it would have been on television 24-7. So this event struck terror in the South because Southerners believed that Northerners were now willing to come down to the South and try and get slaves to rise up against them and at this point, Southerners are like, uh, this isn't going to work anymore. We need to be our own country. We do not want Northerners coming down here and messing with our society and messing with our system. Um, so you had the Dred Scott decision, which has upset the North. And now you have Brown's raid, which has very much upset the South. 
So then we had an election, and this is one of the most interesting elections in U.S. history and one of the most consequential. Interesting because there were four different candidates running. Also interesting because not all four candidates were even allowed or permitted to run in all of the states. Sound interesting? It was. What happened in the election of 1860? So feelings over slavery had reached a fever pitch by the time the election of 1860 came around, and it was not helpful that you had James Buchanan in the White House, who was widely considered to be literally the worst president uh, we have ever had up until the modern era. Um, he was feckless and weak and would not take any stands of any kind. So it was a four-way race for president, which allowed a northerner to win for the first time in years. One of the reasons the Civil War did not happen sooner is that southerners continued to get elected as president of the United States, and northerners kind of put up with that. In this case, a northerner actually won. Because the vote was split between four candidates, Abraham Lincoln became the first president ever elected, and he became elected by winning all of the northern states and having the Democratic vote divided amongst the other three candidates. Uh, Stephen Douglas was only allowed to run in the northern states, and in the south, John Bell and John Breckinridge were the only candidates permitted on the ballot. So you literally had different candidates permitted on the ballot in different states which is a peculiarity of our federal system, but that is still technically possible. You actually do have to file for election in all of the states, and some states can let you on the ballot, and some states don't have to. They all have their own laws about that. So, so his views on slavery were so uh, frightening to the South um, that this really pushed the southern states over the edge. Uh, Lincoln's philosophy was slavery can continue to exist where it already exists, but it should not, under any circumstance, be allowed to expand beyond the states where it already exists. So Kansas, Nebraska, Utah, and New Mexico, from Lincoln's perspective, absolutely positively should not have slavery, which means that slavery would be contained in the south. That means that the Southerners would eventually realize that the Northerners would eventually be able to outvote them and would probably eventually be able to get rid of slavery. That was a non-starter to the Southern states. As a result, by the time Lincoln became president, between November and March, um, many Southern states seceded and formed their own country, the Confederate States of America. They literally left the United States said, we are no longer part of the United States. They banded together and they formed their own country called the Confederate States of America. So by the time Lincoln became president, he was only becoming president over half of the country that he originally ran to be president of. And we have the seeds here, folks, of a titanic conflict uh, and by far the most important conflict uh, in the history of of this nation. And, and let's take a look at how that election panned out. This right here is a map of the election of 1860 based upon how the counties voted. And as you can see in the South, uh, Stephen A. Douglas was allowed on the ballot in some counties, but not very many. You do not see a single red county uh, in the southern states. It looks like Lincoln was permitted to run in Missouri, but in the north, all you have are Douglas and Lincoln. Looks like Pennsylvania allowed some of the southern candidates to run, but none of these states did. So you can literally see based on the color codes. And then it looks like California and Oregon uh, allowed all of the candidates on the ballot. And so the breakdown in California and Oregon's counties were unique. California and Oregon voted for Lincoln, by the way. Uh, primarily because of um, Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington counties, it looks like. So just take a gander at that for a moment, folks. That is a very telling map of how Lincoln got elected and how this area right here decided to break off and form its own country. And you'll notice South Carolina didn't even participate in the election. 
And South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union and say we are no longer part of the United States. So ladies and gentlemen, if I were to create an essay question for all of the information I've had in these two lectures, uh, it would look something like this. Briefly describe the sequence of events that led to the Civil War. What role did compromise play in delaying the Civil War? What happened when compromise was no longer possible? How did the Dred Scott decision and Brown's raid fan the flames of conflict? And why did the election of 1860 push things over the edge to secession and war? It is very possible. I may ask you to write an essay explaining all of that. If I do, it would probably have a take-home quality to it, because that's a lot to memorize uh, for an essay question on a test. But, but there it is, ladies and gentlemen. And whether or not you are or are not concerned about the essay, I do want you to write a summary at the bottom of your Cornell notes uh, encompassing all of the information in today's lecture. Remember, if you have one summary statement for each left side question, you're in good shape. You should be fine. I'll give you time to do that. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, you know what comes next. It is once again time for Mr. Blumendahl to sign off until next time on the Waldo Middle School S Social Studies YouTube channel. Bada bing.